So I'm continuing this video series with the second part of Culture War and Content Creation. In the first part of this series, I overviewed some of the archetypes of leadership that any successful dissident movement would have to contain. However, in this first part of the series, I think things got a little too abstract. Certainly, the hardest part in any struggle to obtain leadership or self-improvement is in the implementation. And providing people with abstract archetypes doesn't really move one forward in that direction. The difficulty of this task is compounded in the case of trying to make yourself a leader, largely because the question of leadership is mixed up with the question of power, political or otherwise. Once more, I feel like our own post-Enlightenment age has made this problem more difficult. Democracy, for whatever other benefits it might has, has the disadvantage of obscuring how power is actually obtained and distributed. The point of the post-Enlightenment Republican democracies is to make citizens more interested in their own business than obtaining political power writ large. Furthermore, the stories we tell ourselves about successful political movements and successful leaders tend to be caught up in democracy's own propaganda. We believe in, or say we believe in, things like the will of the people, or the voice of a generation. A more sober analysis of affairs demonstrates that most of these wills of the people and voices of generations were selected and were not so organically developed as we might expect from the propaganda. Still, the question returns, if one is truly dissatisfied with the world, if one wants to become a leader, how should one go about pursuing power and developing themselves as a leader? How do we describe accurately and effectively the relationship of leadership and power? Once more, I think people who've grown up in Western liberal societies have been left with certain perspectives about how one is to properly obtain power and authority. In the rare instances where we admit that the concept of power exists and that we dole it out, usually the model we are given is that we need to work our way up through a hierarchy. We respect the rules, we keep our nose to the grindstone, and eventually things will work out. You might not become the most powerful person in the world, but you'll be a stakeholder, your ideas will be listened to, and you'll be granted some measure of dignity. I think one of the great markers of our own political time, insofar as the culture war is concerned, is that this understanding of power, dignity, and authority has been completely undermined. Not least of which because our cultural leaders aren't respecting many of the rules and regulations regarding their relationships with the other subjects of this country and their culture. But once more, this video's subject is not the state of the current culture war, nor how we got here, but rather how we deal with the situation now that we are in the place we are. And in our current cultural environment, simply following the philosophy of nose to the grindstone, obey authority, and try to live the moderate life is not really going to get you anywhere. A political and cultural power game is being played right over your head, and eventually, if you're not prepared, you might fall victim to its machinations. Not to repeat or preview things I've already said in my Jordan Peterson video, but this focus on individualism and clean your room mentality is very insufficient, even though the advice is generally good. However, as I've mentioned in the last Culture War and Content Creation video, as well as many times in my YouTube career, the reaction that the right has had to this new situation has not entirely been productive. In fact, characterizing the approach of the distant right over the last two and a half years, I would say it was entirely unproductive. To a certain degree, I think the mistakes are forgivable. When someone is playing a game and they realize that the rules they thought were in effect are no longer being enforced, the natural temptation is to play the game as if there were no rules, as if there was no difference between wisdom and folly. I think we can see a lot of these mistakes being made in the alt-right in 2017, and also in the euphoria that erupted in many distant right circles after the election of Donald Trump. There was a sense that, since our opponents weren't playing by the rules, no rules really applied, an impression that was complemented by the seeming invulnerability of Donald Trump himself, a figure that appeared to break all of the media's rules about how a politician should conduct themselves, but still was able to secure a political victory. As the news cycle has demonstrated since 2017, this impression of invulnerability towards people who break the rules and assert power that they may or may not have 
is entirely fictitious, even if Trump himself possesses some sort of Teflon coating. Since that time, I think the right has been in a little bit of a crisis regarding how to approach power and leadership. Everyone agrees that optics is needed, but at the same time, we shouldn't play by our enemy's rules. How to strike a balance? Many people from the neo-reaction movement have been fond of saying that what one needs to do is become worthy of power. Become worthy, then rule, has always been an aphorism of neo-reaction. But the phrase has seen new life after 2017, when the distant right failed to achieve ascendancy in the culture or even in the right wing generally. I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiment of become worthy, then take power. However, to someone hearing it in a casual setting, the phrase seems to make both of the previous mistakes simultaneously. Initially, the first part of the aphorism seems to fall into the clean your room bucko mentality, the idea that one can only obtain political power when they've cleared a certain number of hurdles in their own life. This seems, initially, to be another entreatment to keep your nose to the grindstone and keep on keeping on. Stay the course. And we've heard this message before from other boomer and neoconservative sources. It's not entirely wrong, but it misses the entire point of politics. If there is no stable political reality, any attempt to put the blinders on and keep trudging on will be completely counterproductive. But strangely enough, the second part of the aphorism, become worthy, then take power, also seems to fall into the alternative camp's mistake, asserting power that you don't have in the attempt to not play by your enemy's rules. Claiming power you have not yet achieved in order to keep your enemies off balance and not play by their rules. I mean, when was the last time anyone was able to take power? It sounds like the reins of power are completely open, just waiting for the right Machiavellian individual to claim the crown or to sit on the Iron Throne. It's a Promethean statement, but it's utterly detached from how modern power is allocated and wielded. Nevertheless, I think that both of these interpretations of the phrase are naive. They don't capture what's really being addressed by the neo-reactionaries who use it. And part of this is just sloppy phrasing. If I were to restructure the aphorism, become worthy, then rule, I would probably say something like this. Train oneself to be able to wield the power that is necessary to defend your community, and then endeavor to defend your community and the fate of your posterity going forward. Breaking it down this way, for my money, captures the real essence of the phrase. The question is not whether you're worthy enough for some abstract notion of power. And power isn't simply the rod, throne, and scepter, the major political power we ordinarily associate with military and governments. We are using both terms in a much more general sense. Everyone listening to this lives in a community. Everyone listening to this lives in a society. And in these types of structures, there are power relations going on all around us. Linguistic, cultural, political, economic, and otherwise. And like it or not, the decisions that are being made day to day are going to have impacts on the long-term sustainability of our community and the well-being of our posterity, both near-term and long-term. As such, I believe that there is a core responsibility we have as individuals to work for the collective interest of our communities. Participating in politics is not something that's discretionally done. It's a responsibility of all those who care about other people, the communities that gave them their culture and their life. As such, we cannot shirk from our responsibilities. We cannot help but be political and participate in the power games as they exist, at whatever level we can. But we have to be realistic. We don't do ourselves or our communities any good by trying to obtain heights of power that we do not have the competence nor the foresight to wield effectively. In light of this, an individual needs to exercise both boldness, fortitude, and a certain type of honesty. What does our community need? What does it need to survive? What are we truly capable of delivering? What power would we be confident in entrusting with ourselves if we were our friends and family? And if the answer to that question is not much, we owe it to ourselves and others around us to train ourselves to be better leaders, to become more responsible and more productive, so that we can hope to wield the power that our community needs in order to sustain itself. In short, take on what you can, but always be looking to improve. But here, I think, comes another problem. 
Well, it's all well and good to talk about improving yourself and becoming worthy of leadership. The other difficulty with the aphorism become worthy than rule is that no one in society really talks about leadership, at least not leadership in the context of radical dissident dissent. As such, oftentimes online, you hear a lot of aphorisms about getting better and improving yourself, but not very many specifics. For a while, I've wanted to put out a document that outlined my own thoughts about how someone could improve themselves and better form themselves into a leader, someone who is worthy of wielding power at some level. Again, this is quite hard because nobody has ever fully learned everything there is about leadership. Every time I wrote out a list of recommendations or things that worked for me, I felt really pretentious as if I were trying to teach something that I myself hadn't really learned. The whole endeavor felt a little bit too much in the spirit of Jordan Peterson, too much in the spirit of self-help guides, and there didn't seem to be any way to talk about this or write about it without coming off as a pompous ass. Still, as I have observed the right wing, I see the same mistakes over and over and over again, and frankly I want to do something to help. I'm not saying I've figured out everything, but I feel if there's anything I can do to help people catch up to where I am at this stage, I do well to offer whatever insight I'm able to give. I held onto this sentiment for quite some time until I saw one of my own favorite YouTubers shut down their original channel and reformulate it as a new one. This new channel titled The Franklin was largely focusing on helping people obtain more responsibility and more order in their own lives, less by providing insights, a definitive self-help answer, and more just simple observations about what worked for the vlogger in question. After watching some of the Franklin's initial videos and talking to him in person, I decided that I would finally put out a short list of my own observations about forming oneself into a leader. Once more, this is not to say that I have all the answers, but this is just my best attempt to date to get together some list of recommendations that I think could be followed to improve oneself and to make oneself more effective, both online and in real life. And by all means, if you think that I've missed something or left something out or haven't addressed a blind spot, feel free to update these as much as you can. This is very much a first step, a working draft, if you will. But for any who are interested in the next part of this program, feel free to listen to this advice and see if any of my observations or advice might apply profitably to your own endeavors. I think odds are, based on what I've seen from right-wingers online and in real life, there's probably a lot to be learned here. So let's get started. What are the rules that I've learned so far about developing leadership and developing responsibility for yourself online and in real life? specifically as a right-winger or non-progressive. The first of my rules is, in the words of Douglas Adams, don't panic. Now, when I first put this list together, I had some questions about what order they should all go in, but I knew that this first rule, this first observation, would have to come first, because I think it is really the most important thing especially for those of us on the right. If you're someone who considers themselves on the distant right or even a sympathizer with the distant right, you probably experience the world as a very hostile place, or will experience it in very short order as a very hostile or very disorienting place. Being on the right means you understand the destructiveness and decadence of many of the cultural phenomenon that are going on right now. This is compounded by the fact that far from opposing or even describing accurately the phenomenon that are so destructive, the media is, to a man, on board with all of these changes. They're in many ways the drivers of these changes. As such, for a right-winger, for anyone who is following in the traditional practice of Western civilization and Christianity, it feels as once as though the world has gone crazy, as though up has been made down and down has been made up. I mean, just how much can you be at home inside a society that freaks out when some kid in a MAGA hat smiles, but then applauds prepubescent transgenderism and drag queen story hour? I think that there is a distinct temptation, especially in this age of social media and the internet, to just wallow in this despair, to welcome this initial feeling of disassociation. And to a certain degree, we have to remind ourselves that this is not normal. But there's a price to be paid for this, especially if we make this emotion part of our daily lives. 
and that is eventually clown world will get to us. It will start grading on our emotional health, making us panic. As these destructive cultural phenomenon become more and more popular and may spread through our own friend group, we may distrust people that we have no reason to distrust just because they are on the wrong side of popular political trends. And while I think it's important at all times to remember why destructive cultural trends are destructive, it's not healthy to have these observations take over your life. What results many times from this perspective is online right-wing activists being obsessed, angry, panicky, and fearful of trends that are occurring all around us in the culture, be they cultural, religious, demographic, or political. Now, I know a lot of people who listen to my channel are in their early to mid-20s. And people in their early to mid-20s are used to hearing about a lot of things that are unhealthy that they do anyway. Oh, drinking is unhealthy, don't do it. Oh, eating junk food as your primary diet is unhealthy, don't do it. You hear all of these warnings, and likely in your 20s you do them anyway, and suffer very, very little consequence for it. Now, while I can assure all listening that this trend does not hold going into your 30s, there is probably very little I can do to convince younger people of that fact. But just so I don't leave this warning on a completely abstract note, I should point out here what I mean when I say that working yourself into a state of constant apprehension, panic, and distaste for the normie world will have no good end. A lot of people, especially YouTubers, have commented on some of the psychological problems that are common among right-wingers. Some minor. There is a preponderance of depression, but I think this is more or less equivalent to what you see on the left maybe even less so, and it's probably something that you'll notice in any politically radical population. Still, more common on the right is a type of paranoia, a type of despondent rejection of the outside world. I think you see this a lot when you talk to people from Generation Z and other younger folks on the right who've really come up and matured inside shitposting communities. There is a certain desperation in the meme magic community, and it's very evident when you look at the personalities involved more closely. Moreover, to pick on psychological phenomenon that's more common on the right, I can also think of internet and political burnout. I myself have begun to feel this, but it's something that's very, very common to distant people, especially on the right wing. There's only so much you can take. Living a lifestyle all about being outspoken concerning unpopular ideas. For this reason, the right in particular has an enormous attrition rate. People who disappear from the internet altogether or are simply incapable of making content or new videos. And this effect, collectively over the years, has marked a huge setback for the right wing generally. But I would say that in all three of these instances, be it depression, paranoia and nihilism, or just plain burnout, the culprit is panic. People get too emotionally involved in what really should be a dispassionate endeavor. Now, while I understand that the personal is political, and that the chaos of the modern era can't help but be in some sense emotional to most people who experience it firsthand, is it not too much to ask for or even try to cultivate a certain amount of professional detachment, even when we're in the sphere of activism, even when we're in the sphere of the culture war? Regardless of what us in the millennial generation have been raised to believe, no one ever emoted their way to a political victory. Although, arguably, I guess you could say that political victories have been bestowed on much too emotional people. Still, reacting to every single news item, participating in the outrage cycle that has been the de facto mode of political engagement these last 10 years cannot have any real productive outcomes. And as I've mentioned before, I just think that there is a toll on the emotional health of people who participate in it. The right does not need more paranoid psychos. The right does not need more good guys who finally snapped. The right does not need people trying to reenact elaborate revenge and power fantasies. We do not need more activists who seem like they come from movies like Falling Down or American Psycho. I know after every new disaster, the right says they've learned this lesson, but somehow it never really seems to take root. 
If I were to speculate why this lesson is never learned, though, I think it probably has something to do with how politics and the news interact with social media. Once more, we are encouraged to panic. We are encouraged to be emotionally reactive by the outrage cycle. When one experiences outrage, when one experiences righteous indignation, in addition to a fear response, there's also a dopamine rush. It feels good. It's addictive. But at the same time that this political outrage cycle is addictive and constantly keeps you involved with the news of the day and mainstream politics, it simultaneously works to make one a less effective political actor. It encourages all of the previous qualities I've mentioned, depression, paranoia, and just plain burnout. There's also a kind of learned helplessness that comes from the situation, being outraged day after day and still not being able to do anything. I mean, I'm a pretty pessimistic guy by nature. I have a pretty bleak outlook on the present world and even sometimes on the future. But when I talk to people, when I talk to contemporaries, when I talk to people who know me from my internet presence, or even sometimes when I talk to my progressive friends, I notice that there is this incredible emotional response. People feel injured. They're in some sense desperate for an answer, for anything. You can literally feel the fear and emotional fatigue come off these people when you talk to them. And it breaks my heart, I sincerely sympathize. But still, I will note that as bad as things are in the present world, as much as I acknowledge the dire state we are in, this feeling of helplessness and paranoia that most people experience, it's cultivated. It's something that we have brought upon ourselves, not by honest assessment of the world, but simply by social media addiction, by addiction to an outrage cycle that keeps us in a state of constant disapprobation and helplessness. And it's a cycle that we need to work hard to stop. And this brings me to the second point of how to form yourself into a leader. And that is to limit addictive tendencies and to cultivate personal growth over comfort. Now, I understand that this one is a really tall order and... Anyone listening to this probably doesn't need another reminder about the negative effects that the internet has on our own psychology, our own personalities. However, as I've continued to participate in internet dialogue, as I've continued to observe the development of my own generation, the millennials, I've come to realize just how much of an impact addictive tendencies and the choice of comfort over development has had on our generation. Perhaps we need to remind ourselves constantly just what a problem this is, because for most of us, this is the problem. We are a generation of people that has lived in constant distraction, that has always been given another reason to put off truly mature decision making. We are a generation that's constantly struggling to find ourselves, and to really find the will to become the adults that we were always meant to be. A world of internet and video games and constant social media validation has contributed to this, as I think you see the problems of depression and anxiety becoming more and more an issue as the millennial generation goes on. And as always, the culprit takes a certain form that's very predictable. We all like our little hits of dopamine. The Twitter feed that gives you a constant ring of stimulation. The video game that constantly makes you want to play more of it. It's not just that we have better soma, it's that almost nobody isn't addicted to some form of these reinforcing pleasures. We've gotten into a mode of living where we're assured that everything is going to see instant fruition, instant results. We live in a constant stream of dopamine rushes every 10 minutes. We feel uncomfortable when we can't check our phone or social media feed, when we can't drown out a mundane task with a podcast. And this has very predictable results. Anxiety, depression, and I should say a certain amount of learned helplessness. It's not fun to be in the situation. It's not conducive to happiness, even though every single interaction, every single little distraction always seems to promise happiness just over the horizon. As a result, the millennials are a generation that is inundated in depression and anxiety. They're incredibly ineffective at getting things done, and at the end of the day, for all their distractions and entertainment, we're not even that happy. And I'm one to talk. I'm certainly guilty of this myself. I mean, I've tried to limit my addiction to electronics somewhat, but it seems every time you exercise a demon, two more come to fill their places. I gave up playing AAA video games 
only to have other forms of social media take its place. And it wasn't until I finally gave up using the social media network Twitter that I really understood the negative psychological impact it was having on me. It was making me an angrier person, and at the same time, it was making me addicted to using it. Even though everything said and done, the network didn't really offer me much utility. Except, of course, feeling like I was accomplishing something every time I sent out a snarky tweet that very few people would read. And the danger of this is only compounded for people who want to use social media for the purposes of good and human development. As I've said in previous videos, we seem to be in some sort of weird devil's bind, with bad options on either side. We need political organization, we need to have sane voices in the public square, but now the public square is Twitter, a tool that itself causes people to degrade emotionally. It certainly caused me to degrade emotionally. As such, it seems like good actors in this sphere are constantly faced with the dilemma of the ring of power. We can use the tools of the enemy, but in some sense the influence is corrupting and we become our own worst enemy. It always seems like we're staring down what I have termed the Noah Antweiler effect. This, of course, named after Noah Antweiler, the spoony one an early YouTube movie reviewer who was famous for delivering quite clever and snarky reviews of video games and sci-fi movies, who, after obtaining an enormous amount of money from his patrons to expand his project, subsequently fell into indolence and non-productivity because of his addiction to Twitter. Social media made him a rock star, but it also at the same time destroyed his life. In short, the type of social validation that could at one point only be earned by productive behavior now could be obtained simply by tweeting out weird, strange social media posts. And after time went on, this surrogate, this simulacrum, slowly began to replace the actual authentic product itself. This story certainly has repeated itself many, many times, and I'm sure many people can think of similar examples in our very own right-wing corner of the internet. And while I don't want to be like Jordan Peterson, boiling everything down to the individual, this effect certainly has external causes, I will point out the very obvious fact that the consequence of this learned helplessness of social media and self-gratifying addiction at the end of the day comes down to personal choices we all make between comfort and self-development. Our life is governed by tiny decisions about how to use our time, about walking away from addicting patterns of behavior. And once more, I'm one to speak. I've certainly been a victim of this in my own life. And it doesn't really make sense to say, oh, just improve yourself. Just stop the addictive behavior you've become accustomed to, whether that is video games or abusive use of social media or whatever. To a person who's ridden by anxiety and depression, and once more a certain type of learned helplessness, this kind of platitudinous advice is going to be worth almost nothing. Though I think, nevertheless, the framework of understanding the problem is important to establish at the outset. What we are trying to do when we attempt to become leaders is to prioritize development. We are trying to slowly get better. Continual self-refinement is simultaneously the prerequisite, but also the product of someone executing leadership properly. And all subsequent parts of this series have to be understood through that lens. And in many ways, the easiest way to understand what exactly this looks like, what exactly this would look like, is to, surprise, surprise, go and examine other successful leaders in other contexts, be they activists, governmental leaders, or CEOs. What are the temperaments, what are the qualities of the successful executives in the corporate sphere, for instance? Now, as someone who's worked in manufacturing and in science, I have some experience with the executive class of our age, and to a man, they all seem very similar to me. People make this joke all the time in the workplace, but there is very much an executive type, and its qualities can be quite easily realized. Optimistic, athletic, punctual, and more than anything else, resilient. Now, once more, I certainly don't embody all of these qualities, and it is certainly tempting to say that there is some subjectivity going on in how these people are promoted, how they're elevated to the positions that they now occupy. Certainly among other people I've worked with, there was the impression that athletic, optimistic people just got promoted because the upper management liked them more because they were like them. 
Sadly, in hindsight, I've come to believe that this is simply not the case. These executive types are there because they get shit done. A person in their position without similar personality traits just might not be able to handle the pressure and the constant risk of loss. Now, to some degree, I feel a little bit guilty about this observation. In late 2018, I and a number of other right-wing blockers were going around more or less moaning about how unfair it was that the left was so much better funded, so much better institutionally supported. And of course, we had numbers to back this up. It is observable. The left has more institutional support. It does have more funding both online and off. And for a while, I think it was fun to imagine on the right wing that had you been a left winger, you would be a CEO or an executive. You would be elevated to a position of authority and would be able to sidestep a lot of the small indignities that naturally accompany a career as an internet content creator. Once more, I think we are putting the cart before the horse. While it is true that distant right content creators online have done more for this movement than many of our equivalent left-wing content creators, money and institutional support naturally follow those with the personalities to wield money and institutional support. And for many people on the right, we simply have not cultivated the habits and temperament to be able to do that effectively. Leaving aside that investing in dissident movements is always a risky proposition for PR, something that rich institutions are always aware of. Any person who imagines themselves to be in a CEO-type position would have to understand a few things about the personality that really thrives in that kind of environment. As I've said, CEOs are almost always athletic. They almost always have played sports. More or less because I think this gives a person a good perspective on risk-taking, what it means to lose, and also, more importantly, what it means to take risks and win. Leaders always need to have an eye towards expansion. This, I think, is complemented quite directly by the optimism and resilience that you see in most executive figures. Executives are in constant danger of massive loss and of massive failure, and yet they shrug it off. My favorite representation of this in movie form has always been Jeremy Irons in the movie Margin Call, who perfectly captures this type of resilient optimism that I've seen in other executives in real life. In the movie, he plays the chairman of a Goldman Sachs-type corporation, an investment banking firm in the middle of the 2008 financial crisis. And after suffering the worst day in financial history, after losing billions upon billions of dollars, and sacrificing most of the company's reputation, he is found at the end of the day happily munching on a steak, thinking about all the money he saved his investors by his quick thinking. Indeed, there is some truth to this, but in some sense his temperament keeps him insulated from the massive amounts of losses that he has taken, the possible consequences that could be waiting for him down the road. And this type of bravado and courage is somewhat needed in high-level leaders. It's true we need someone who's aware of the dangers, but there's a lot of death due to just plain risk aversion, paralysis by analysis. Now, I know it sounds kind of silly looking at CEOs and high-powered executives to ascertain qualities of leadership we want to ape. It seems like it's really an insurmountable peak that I'm sitting before us. But it's fair to ask, how do we slowly embody this type of optimism and health? How do we bring it forth in our own lives? And this question, I think, has a quite definitive answer, a quite definitive ending place in the formation of new and better habits. Once more, I don't want to belabor Jordan Peterson points, but as humans, people only learn and get better at things through habitual practice. Whatever it is you're trying to get good at, whatever it is you're trying to do, you have to make it part of your ordinary daily behavior. If you're looking to improve physically, exercise every day, change your diet, if you're looking to write or make videos, record or write every day. The decision to continue the behavior and make it habitual will make the improvement part of your reality itself. Moreover, I think this is bordering on the platitudinous. I don't expect anyone to be hearing this for the first time. Still, if there's one thing that I can bring to my audience that I have observed at least in my own life, it's this. Human beings can only support concentrated, directed effort for roughly 15 to 20 minutes. 
Short an adrenaline rush, and sometimes even with an adrenaline rush, every 15 or 20 minutes you reset. You have to take stock of the task again and recenter yourself. As such, in any given day, your decision, your process of setting yourself up to accomplish something, is more or less your attempt to focus yourself in very, very short intervals of time. As such, a decision whether to check your phone or to get back to work are essential. You have to fight to suppress your own tendency to distract yourself and go back into the addictive mode of behavior. Pushing through and obtaining true focus is the only way to develop true good habits, truly good productive behavior. It's hard, perhaps some of the hardest things humans actually have to do, to force themselves to do something that they don't really want to do, that their body is rebelling against because it wants to get that little dopamine hit. Nevertheless, the struggle for development, the struggle for leadership in oneself, begins with those small decisions every day, again and again. But once more, this again sounds platitudinous. If anything, the last 10 years have demonstrated that in some ways the temptation of the dopamine rush is stronger than most good habits, at least in millennials. So what then is stronger than habit? Well, I think this can be definitively answered. Company is stronger than habit. This, once more, is a classic piece of folk wisdom that you've probably heard again, but I'm going to reiterate it here. Committing to things individually is hard. Having a group of friends commit to something is a lot less difficult. Doing one half hour of strenuous exercise every day is hard, but playing tennis with friends for two hours twice every week? Well, that's easy. In many ways, we could speculate that the addictive hole of self-gratification most millennials have fallen into is largely owed to the fact that we have fewer and fewer real-life friends. We're altogether a less social generation than our predecessors. As such, we have fewer people encouraging us into good habits, and more and more things that simply vindicate our own bad ones. Once more, I think this poses a particular bind for right-wingers, especially right-wingers like myself who live in highly blue areas. I can find people to do activities with, sometimes even activities that have very, very good productive impacts on my own life, but the people I do it with are all progressive. Eventually, as a movement, right-wingers are going to have to confront this issue or die. We need to have organizations that can link people up. And in this, there is sort of a chicken-in-the-egg problem. We need leaders to form the next generation of right-wing social organizations. But leaders need to have good socialization to be leaders. For my money, social and personal development should always be pursued over ideological purity. While it's true that there is a certain amount of ideological contagion that occurs, you do slide towards the average opinion of your friend group slowly as the relationship progresses. Nevertheless, given how crazy the world has been getting, given how insane clown world is, I think that this slow ideological drift is becoming less of an issue. That requires a certain amount of complacency, and no one is feeling complacent. In some ways, right-wingers might have to fear outright exclusion before they have to fear actual ideological entropy coming from a slow and gradual complacency towards progressivism. Once more, this is a toss-up. Everyone who lives in a blue area is going to have to make their own call. And people who live in sparsely populated red areas with less thick cultural institutions have their own struggles getting things together, no doubt. But whatever our individual problems are, I think it's important to always keep an eye towards the community that we're forming around ourselves and how we make it better. You need friends that encourage you to do productive things, and you also need friends that you can talk about your own ideology with. People who support you in your own endeavors. And perhaps very slowly over time, those two groups can be brought together so that both tasks can be accomplished at once. I don't know, it's just a thought, but that objective needs to be central in what we're doing, as we're developing both ourselves as leaders and our own communities, which in many ways is a project that's always pursued in tandem. Still, if for whatever reason we can't find a community to slowly develop ourselves, I still have learned to take a few aphorisms to remind myself of what I should always be looking for when I seek to develop myself as a leader individually in my own projects. Briefly, I can go over them here. The first aphorism I take and always remind myself of is always be learning. 
everything we do in our lives, everything we do as intelligent creatures, is in some sense learning, is in some sense training ourselves to do things better. Once we stop learning, we cease to be doing things in an intelligent way. We are just going over things in a rote fashion. Learning is a hard activity, but in some sense it's the only way that we are really engaged in anything. It's the only way that we bring things forward. As such, when we take on a new task, I think it behooves people to maintain a certain amount of flexibility. So, you've never coded a computer, you've never edited a video, you've never learned how to use a VPN. Well, all these things can be learned. Perhaps you've never learned how to play an instrument or sing and you want to do so inside a religious community. Perhaps you are going to explore a foreign country for business reasons, and you've never learned a foreign language. Well, these aren't really problems, they're opportunities. And the more we see them as opportunities, the more we are really embodying leadership at a basic level. Every setback and reverse is an opportunity to grow more, to change oneself. Now, of course, while well, this Nietzschean aphorism, whatever does not kill me makes me stronger, does have its limitations to be sure, the attitude is always good to keep in mind. We learn through experiences, and those experiences teach us new things. And I think that this is just important to take when it comes to interpersonal relationships as well. At a very young age, I had the privilege to see the great scientist James Watson speak about his discovery of DNA. And the first thing he said when he got up to the podium was, I wonder how I got a Nobel Prize when I probably don't have an IQ above 120. A kind of self-deprecating remark that everyone in the audience laughed at before he assured them he wasn't kidding. He went on to say that the number one thing he learned in his own life is that you never wanted to be the smartest person in the room. You always wanted to be learning from people who are your colleagues, and perhaps even people who are your adversaries. I find this position of always learning to be one of the true marks of good leaders. In addition to this being a mark of intelligence and true engagement, it's also a practiced, cultivated attitude of flexibility, of making oneself anti-fragile. The learning process itself is somewhat akin of breaking down what you previously thought and reconstructing it in a better way. A somewhat analogous process of developing muscle matter. By constantly learning from people around you, you're making yourself stronger and more flexible. And this creates the sort of robust, risk, non-averse personality type that is so common among the executive class. And I think learning is really at the root of this. The second rule of thumb I like taking to the role of leadership that I try to repeat to myself always is the aphorism I've used many times in my own live streams, always be building. This is another key feature of leadership, and that is the fact that we always want to see external validation for what we do and what our efforts are finally going to come to when everything is said and done. When we put effort into something, when we work hard at a task, it's always good to keep our eyes on the goal. It's always good to remind ourselves what are the actual results of doing this. And while one does not want to fall into the opposite problem of discarding the necessary, but perhaps too abstract and intangible work that seems to be required for a lot of important objectives, I think that there is a good utility in seeing all important work as building external results, at moving things materially forward, or perhaps even spiritually forward. The question of what ultimately is produced is a very useful one, if for no other reason in that it gets around two common mistakes or two common traps that we, especially as millennials, tend to fall into. Two ways of viewing work that I think have really kept us back in a material way. The first intellectual trap that always be building gets us around is credentialism. And this is a serious problem for the millennial generation. Oftentimes, we've been trained to work very, very hard only to produce a certain letter on a paper. We study for a test, even though the information we are learning is useless for us and useless for our further career. The only reason why we take the class and endeavor to do well in it is so we can pass the completely artificial institutional hurdle that's been put before us. The only reason why we do this busy work is so that we can get the approval of those above us. We can show that we're working hard and putting our nose to the grindstone. This is a really, really bad mistake, and something that I think holds people back in higher education just as much as college debt or useless degree programs. 
how much are good grades in college really worth? They certainly take a lot of work to produce. After all, great inflation is a thing, and while I think intellectually challenging yourself is important, and doing well in your classes is important to a degree, I hardly think that having a straight-A average is nearly as good as having something tangible you can show for it. I mean, having a portfolio of engineering projects or writing projects is much more impressive than having A's on some kind of artificial report card, and most employers reward that much more as well. Even for degree programs like history or political science that people usually don't consider to be a large professional asset, developing a portfolio of things that you've actually done, publications you've actually contributed to, research projects you've actually done, papers you've written and tried to get published, even if they've been rejected, that's much more impressive than the piece of paper from a modern university. The result is what in the end the employer wants, and if you can show yourself to be someone who is results-oriented, that's worth more than most of the credentials you get from the academy. The second pitfall that I think the rule of thumb always be building gets us around is what I call stupid work. Now, the platitude, work smarter, not harder, has been repeated and is one more corporate buzzword, but there is a lot of truth to it. But more than this stupid aphorism, I want to point out a mode of conceptualizing work that I found myself falling into, and that is the idea that the harder I'm working, the better I must be doing. This is something that I think a lot of millennials will recognize in themselves, especially if they had middle-class or upper-middle-class parents who prioritized hard work. Now, hard work is important, but I think what a lot of millennials have learned, accidentally, is to, in some sense, simulate hard work, to convince themselves that they're using all their time, that their mind is constantly focused on the task or doing the task. These are the people that are constantly at their desks, regardless of whether the work is actually getting done or not. They want to impress the boss. They want to show people that they are the good worker, even though they're not getting a lot of results done. And regardless of the fact that there is really nothing more destructive than this, a lot of cultures encourage it. You can work very, very hard. You can destroy your personal life and still really not get anything accomplished. I've seen a lot of YouTubers, especially progressive YouTubers, talk about how they're constantly working. They're constantly either doing their blogging or vlogging work or worrying about how they're not doing their blogging or vlogging work. They're always on, and yet when you look at their output, it's not altogether that impressive. And actually, I don't doubt that they're honest about that. They probably are either working all the time or thinking about working all the time. The issue is, is that they're not building all of the time. Most of that work is just to convince themselves that they're actually doing something. It doesn't actually take their project forward. It's what I call dumb work. Whenever I do something, whenever I work, I always have to remind myself to be building, to be materially moving towards the end goal of getting the thing done. If that's not occurring, more often than not, I'm just trying to convince myself that I have my nose to the grindstone, and I'm not really conscious if I'm moving forward or not. So as I like to say, always be building, and at least you'll have something to show for it. And I guess this brings me to the last aphorism that I like to take when developing myself or considering ways to make myself more productive. And this aphorism is always be teaching. Once more, this is an aphorism that focuses more on social interaction. While the first two can be done in isolation, teaching is something that can only be done with other people. And just as I'm wary at giving advice that naturally relies on having a friend group to millennials, a generation that is in many ways uniquely socially isolated, I still think that there are many opportunities to be a teacher that we do not take. There are people who are knocking at our doors looking for guidance, and regardless if we think that we are failures, we can still teach people what not to do. We can still point them in the right direction. We have experiences and we can help others. And in helping others, that is really the best way to educate yourself or even to build something for the future that people can rely on. Now, for people who watch this channel, they know that I like watching progressive YouTube from time to time. And if you watch progressive YouTube, 
YouTube, you know that there are a fair number of incorrect and frankly laughable criticisms that progressives use against reactionaries and conservatives. But every now and again you get a criticism that rings true. And one such criticism is that the right is totally uninterested in education. Worst yet, the criticism extends to say that right-wingers are totally competitively focused. That true to many people's origin as libertarian edgelords, we see everything as one big status hierarchy game. And as such, we do not focus on bringing up the next generation. We do not focus on developing our allies. Because reactionaries and conservatives don't understand what being an ally means. Now, while this criticism is usually exaggerated, and in many cases not true, I can assure anyone watching this that indeed at least reactionaries know what allyship means. We are not individualists. Still, there is a seed of truth in this criticism. Far too often I have seen people on the right competing with each other for clout and status, it seems that there is a constant feeling that we need to figure out who is the biggest fish in our constantly shrinking pond. Quite frankly, this is a game that I don't care to play at all. As far as I'm concerned, up-and-coming right-wingers, even people who are interested in these ideas that don't consider themselves right-wingers, are my allies. They are the true product of this YouTube channel. Insofar as I can give you viewers anything, insofar as I can help you develop and help you carry these ideas forward, I am, if anything, a servant. The opportunity to teach and develop people who will become more prominent than I am is an opportunity. It's a privilege. As I look towards the hiatus I'm about to take in the coming month, I sincerely hope that many of the conservative and reactionary YouTubers that are following in my footsteps have better success than I have had. And while I understand the presence of YouTube purges and biased algorithms are going to make this increasingly difficult, anything I can do to help is something that I should be focusing on. That is, of course, the objective of the very video you're watching right now. And, you know, teaching has a selfish dimension to it as well. Repeating the things that I already think I know and I already think that I have learned means that I understand them better for my own purposes. I grow as I help others, and that, if nothing else, is the basis for building a community, for building institutions that will spring forth into new life in other areas that aren't, strictly speaking, educational. Unsurprisingly, I think these rules for cultivating oneself as a leader eventually come back to cultivating and building community. Humans are a social being, and the notions we have about individualism are fictitious and usually overly romanticized garbage. Once more, I know for a lot of viewers stuck in our thoroughly isolated age, this repetition is going to be discouraging. The marker of most modern self-help books is that they can be done completely individually. You don't need anyone else's help to grow. But I just don't think that this is the case. I think that in order to grow, you need other people, and you need to build relationships. And this is something I think millennials struggle with a lot. Making friends is really hard, especially when you've been in many ways the product of various institutions. You get out of high school or you get out of college and suddenly you're in the real world. There's no artificial holding cell that's naturally going to force other people to interact with you in a social way. And taking those first steps towards building a community or finding one can be very, very difficult. And if I were to offer any advice on this front, I would simply say that the steps that are needed are to develop close friends, close connections, guarded friendships at first, that can grow, that can become something more, that can transcend their own purpose. Now I know on this front that men and women are very, very different, so I'll restrict my understanding of how to build friendships largely to men. Again, I think it's been said many times that for male friendship to develop in the proper platonic form, there really needs to be an external objective, something to work towards, something to build. As such, if you're looking for that initial connection, it's always good to have a hobby that you organize yourself around. Playing a sport is a great example of this, as is playing a musical instrument in a group. But it can even be a stupid hobby, like playing a board game or building miniatures collecting stamps, 
it really doesn't matter. The one suggestion, however, that I would put in as a requirement is that whatever the hobby is, however stupid it might be, it's got to be in physical space. The problem with purely digital relationships is that they seem to never be able to get over that essential hurdle. They never seem to move past the purely intellectual exchange of ideas to the point where you're doing favors for the other person, helping them out, building something together, and learning from and teaching the other person. Critical aspects of the friendship are impossible to achieve in a purely online context. While I like to think that the people I interact with online are my friends, and in some sense they are, I think until I meet them personally, that friendship is still in a very hypothetical sense. If I'm being realistic, my online friends are really in more of a pre-friendship state, one I will in the future endeavor to complete by meeting them in real life. Still, I think it is in developing these deep connections that real right-wing communities can be brought about, and subsequently real right-wing leaders can be found and developed. Right-wing ideas are born out of thick communities. That's what produces them, and that's what they seek to replicate. And as such, this step is a critical part of developing oneself as an actual leader. You have to build the connections that will, at some time in the future, possibly lead towards a thicker community. This is where the rubber meets the road. But I think that this gets us to our final point. The final lesson that I want to leave people with, the final culmination of this step of cultivating yourself as a leader, as someone who can take responsibility. The final thing that you can do, once you have found a community, once you're building friendships, and once you see yourself developing personally, the next thing one can do is to take ownership in a community, to step into the role of being a leader, to walk the walk, so to speak. To many people, this seems a little bit tautological. Oh, so the way to develop oneself as a leader is to essentially become a leader? To do the kind of thing only a leader can do? It seems like I might be putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Still, I will maintain in this talk a few points. 1. Although in decline, local and small communities are still a thing that young people can participate in. Millennials are more socially isolated than previous generations, but they're still not totally isolated, regardless of where you live. 2. Opportunities for taking leadership abound. In fact, people are trying to find more young people to take small roles in leadership wherever you look. Millennials are a generation that is walking away from responsibility. And for that reason, if you're looking for a way to take charge of something, to really take ownership of something, you'll likely find some opportunity. And finally, point three, that as in most things, the best way to learn how to do something is to actually do it. Once you have the basics, once you have yourself in a mode where you can see that you're making progress, getting better and better at the basics, it's time to just take the plunge. Find a community and take a role in it. From my own experience, the easiest places to start are usually charity organizations. Oftentimes, if you're from a religious community, this can be an organization that's already looking for someone young and energetic to take a role doing really basic things. Planning events, going out and leading people in volunteer efforts, just putting things on a Google calendar. These can be really, really big contributions. But more important than just showing up and doing the work, I think what's really, really critical about all of this is the act of taking ownership. Now, there's one thing that I think fully embodies the reactionary or right-wing concept of leadership. It is this notion of ownership. And it's the one thing that I think that the millennial generation, and probably Generation Z as well, has not really been taught. It took me the longest time to learn it. In fact, I'm not even sure I have learned it. As millennials, we are trained to see ownership as a matter of disposal. If I say you own this object, that means that you can use it for your own pleasure, for your own purposes. And if it's not serving your own pleasure and your own purposes, you can dispose of it. It is, in essence, your toy. But this is not the sense that I mean ownership here. When I say ownership, I mean fully investing yourself in whatever object you have taken responsibility for. 
in the words of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, putting your skin in the game, or to go a step further, putting your soul in the game. And this is something that millennials really, really hate doing. They'll work and write and do research and try new things, but as soon as they realize that it will reflect back on them in a permanent way, as soon as they know it will go on their permanent record, that this implicitly is connected to them and will never be detached from them, they choke up and run away. Because to take ownership is to become defined, is to become solid, is in some sense to become part of physicality. To own something real outside yourself is implicitly to acknowledge your own mortality, to acknowledge your own flawedness. As long as one does not take ownership, they can become a disembodied critic, always casting aspersions on what other people have produced. But once someone stands up and says, that's mine, and whether it succeeds or fails reflects upon me, they've taken ownership in a radical way. And it's really scary. We don't like owning things in this sense, because owning them means owning our own flaws and our own mistakes. And it means confessing to our own sins and own shortcomings, coming out to ourselves as someone who can actually do harm to things. Once you take ownership over an object, or an action, or perhaps even another person, you become a radical moral agent in a way that is uncomfortable, in some ways disconcerting, but also, in every way, necessary. And I can attest to this. Even with myself going forward in my own life, it's not comfortable. You face responsibilities that you just can't turn away from. They have to be done. And they will inevitably be permanent. You will be judged based on whether this succeeds or fails. There's no way around it. You've taken the vow. You've taken the plunge. Your skin and soul is in the game. But as uncomfortable as this is, this is the essence of taking ownership. It's the essence of leadership. And in the end, it's the key to true and just power. The main problem with the people who are currently in power is that they don't take ownership or responsibility over that which they wield. They're constantly portraying themselves as custodians, as people who are carrying out some external will that is not their own. They can't stand up and say, yes, I want this, I want it to be that way, and I take responsibility for wanting things that way. Yet, at the end of the day, that's what they're doing. And this refusal to take ownership is really the marker of our times. If there is ever going to be a way to get away from clown world, to restore sanity, it's going to begin with leaders that do take ownership at a very basic level. And once more, that's scary. Because in order to take ownership, one has to be in some sense worthy. And in a very real way, we don't know whether we're worthy until we actually try and do it. We can try to train ourselves. We can try to become better people. But in the end, what will really test our mettle is the reality of taking the plunge, going forward and doing something big, committing to something that is outside yourself and that will define you as a person. I think it's an open question exactly what we can take on, exactly how much responsibility we feel that we can truly maintain. I'm not going to say that this is easy, even looking at the tasks that lay before me, even at the smallest level, taking on some kind of radical responsibility for someone else is terrifying. But one has to go forward anyway. Even if one fails, even if the attempt in some ways destroys our own ego, destroys our own person. Because taking true ownership means putting everything on the line. Being ready to die. Being ready to give things up that give you pleasure. It is sacrifice, plain and simple. It is, in the end, love. And this is what I think humans truly seek when they seek leaders or rulers, either in themselves or other people. There is power in this world. There is power that needs to be wielded. But we want to see it wielded by people who are invested in us and our community. We want to be ruled over by people who are truly allied to our own interests and own beings and who are willing to sacrifice for it. Because I think in this lies the true quality of the leader and the ruler. The one who, however temporarily, however imperfectly, can wield the corrupting scepter of power. 
with motivations of ownership and sacrifice. The one who can put the good of the many before himself, not out of vainglory and pride, but out of self-giving and love. And with this hope, I'll end this chapter, and see you all in the next installment.